Hi, I'm Valerie Steele. Welcome to the 16th Annual Museum at FIT Fashion Symposium. We have an incredible lineup today, uh, so I'm not going to delay it. I think this is going to be one of our most exciting symposia ever. And our first speaker this morning is my colleague Melissa Mara, co-author of the book Fashion Underground, The World of Suzanne Barsh, who's going to be talking about the subcultural capitals, London and New York. So please join me in welcoming Melissa. Thank you, Valerie. Good morning. Former Village Voice journalist Frank Owen asserts, nightclubs were meant to function as laboratories of style, where new trends and modes of being are spearheaded. In the 1980s and 90s, fashion was integral to the nightlife and club culture in London and New York City, and the latter had a reciprocal impact on fashion. By the early 1980s, London's club culture sparked designers' imaginations and transformed the city into a fertile ground for burgeoning fashion trends. Young men and women expressed their creativity through dress, pushing gender boundaries to their limit. In 1985, club, clubs like Lee Bowery's Taboo celebrated extreme dressing by creating an atmosphere entirely devoid of inhibitions. New York City nightclub area known for reinventing itself thematically every six weeks, began combining installation art, fashion, music, and performance in what Paper Magazine described as, quote, a petri dish for creative activity. Hosted by Suzanne Barsh, special club nights attracted various city personalities explicitly instructed to dress up and, quote, make a statement with themselves. By the 1990s, clubs throughout New York City had spaces and budgets for creative projects, be they performances, fashion shows, or visual art exhibitions. This brought together a clientele enamored with sartorial grandeur and provided endless inspiration for the designers, artists, and creative personalities attracted to it. The work of many designers, such as those seen here, were nurtured by the club cultures of the 80s and 90s, which often inspired the creation of clothing well outside the norm. A central theme shared by club culture and fashion is the creation of novel looks and aesthetics by dressing up. Club culture provides a fertile source for, of what sociologist Sarah Thornton calls subcultural capital. Subcultural capital involves being in the know about things that are valued within a particular subculture. According to Thornton, club culture consists of a cluster of subcultures adhering to their own dress codes, dance styles, and music genres. They create a hipness that leads to the formation of new aesthetics and judgments of value. Subcultural capital is objectified into fashionable clothing or haircuts, for instance, and club organizers and fashion designers gain respect not only by accumulating subcultural capital, but via their role in defining and creating it. By exploring nightclubs as a space where music, fashion, and art merge in a cultural exchange, my talk today will look at the reciprocal relationship between club culture and fashion, and the ways in which their subcultural capital is defined and created. Several presenters will be addressing various aspects of London's club culture, so the majority of my talk is going to focus on New York City. By the early 1980s, London's club scene has given rise to the highly influential subculture of the New Romantics. Weekly club nights, such as Bowie Night at Billy's, established a model highly popularized by the end of the decade. Nights at the Blitz in Covent Garden, for example, were instrumental in promoting the new romantics dressed up aesthetic both domestically and overseas. Bowie Night, organized by Steve Strange and Rusty Egan, heralded the emergence of the London club scene, where people expressed themselves through clothes, hair, and makeup. The scene at Billy's bespoke a sardonic rebelliousness, exemplified by dressing up in the midst of an economic recession. Thornton observed that club cultures are taste cultures, housing ad hoc communities, and facilitate the congregation of like-minded people. Because club undergrounds regard themselves as renegade cultures, mainstream culture is the entity opposed and against which they define themselves. Intent on glamorizing their lives, teenagers and 20-somethings, many enrolled in nearby art schools, donned amalgams of theatrical costume and thrift clothes. Their looks were not only hybrids of historical references, but were often, quote, experimental in, ter in terms of gender definition. Strange and Egan ultimately removed their brainchild to the Blitz, a wine bar off Covent Garden. Here, fashion and music merged, producing the eccentric aesthetic that would dominate London's club culture throughout the decade. It was its eccentrically dressed clientele that gave Blitz its notoriety. 
Steve Strange's stringent door policy assured that only creative pioneers who looked like a walking piece of art gained entry. Rather than cater to celebrity clientele, many of the scene's standouts garnered fame in their own right. Milliner Stephen Jones affirmed, quote, the Blitz ruled people's lives. I'd find people who were possible only in my imagination, but they were real, unquote. Jones, who began his career making hats for his dandified new romantic friends at Blitz, today collaborates with some of the world's top designers. Initially termed Blitz kids or cult with no name, this new generation of club go goers was assigned the moniker New Romantics by the media. Fittingly, everyone winced and denied membership. The Blitz meant a lot to me because there was so much creativity collected under one roof, Strange would recall. Not only bands like Spando Ballet and Visage, but young designers, photographers, even milliners. It was like a burst of energy at a time when the London club scene seemed so stagnant. Designer John Galliano has attested, quote, the club scene fed me. Being with other creative people like Boy George was a crucial experience for me. His acclaimed 1984 degree collection for Central St. Martin's titled Lang Croyab reflects the androgyny and historicizing that characterized the new romantic style, supporting Thornton's claim that club cultures produce new aesthetics and judgments of value. Blitz inspired a host of one-nighter clubs, among them Taboo, which attracted a clientele of fashionable club personalities. Leigh Bowery, in particular, became a prominent nightlife figure in London. His outrageous style garnering him the reputation as London's most flamboyant after dark celebrity. Bowery reveled in, in fashion spectacle, elevating dressing up to an art form. While referencing world cultures or the fashions of earlier decades, he experimented with gender bending and manipulated clothing to create physical exaggerations. His use of theatrical makeup, jewelry, and headwear allowed him to transform his appearance entirely. Bowery's personality belied a serious interest in the history of fashion. Of fashion. His private library held numerous books about designers, couturier, uh, about designers Cristobal Balenciaga and Christian Dior among them. This was further evidenced by his desire to understand corsets, which he purchased together with the corsetier Mr. Pearl. Together they took them apart to study their construction. Born in Australia, Bowery studied fashion for two years before coming disenchanted with the restrictions of formal training. He emigrated to London and immersed himself in the club scene, befriending the designer Rachel Auburn. Bowery and Auburn began collaborating on clothing designs, using the club space to showcase their fashions. They became regulars in the club world alongside other visionaries such as artist Trojan. Bowery and Trojan attained celebrity status with flamboyant looks such as Packies from Outer Space and Picasso Face. Bowery launched Taboo in 1985. The club's mantra, dress as though your life depends on it or don't bother, promoted individual expression and a bold, exaggerated aesthetics. Taboo provided Bowery himself with a venue for experimenting with performance art and showcasing his camp style, which became increasingly provocative. Taboo closed its doors in 1986, following the death of Trojan from a drug overdose. But in its short existence, it made Bowery a cult figure, ultimately redefining nightlife in London and New York City. As Stephen Jones explained, quote, there was drug taking in the club scene, but it wasn't like you had to take drugs to be part of the group. Really, our drug was fashion, unquote. Bowery, a fashion extremist, strove to be unique. However, his influence would impact designers such as Alexander McQueen and John Galliano, just to name a few. During the 1980s, a number of New York City clubs, including Danceteria and Area, began catering to an art, fashion, performance crowd, attracting cool, creative people who look great. Area, in particular, brought installation art and performance art into the nightclub setting. Showcasing a different theme every six weeks, Area encouraged patron participation, eliminating any distinction between performer and audience. The epic Danceteria presented fashion shows on its second level, introducing the industry to then unknown designers. Meanwhile, the mega club Palladium was forging its own connections between the art world and nightlife. Co-owner Steve Rubelk proclaimed, artists are the new stars of the 80s. Thus, Palladium, thus, Palladium commissioned works by designers such as Keith Haring and Kenny Scharf for the club's decor. Scharf's VIP room for Palladium is seen here. By the late 1980s, an economic crash and the AIDS epidemic ushered in a new conservatism that stifled the nightlife community. So palpable was this effect that in 1987, Village Voice columnist Michael Musto wrote an article titled, 
the death of downtown, who took the life out of nightlife? This outlook proved premature, however, as in the 1990s, New York saw a rebirth of its nightlife, and with it, a cross-pollination between nightclubs, fashion, art, and music. With many mega clubs shut down by the economic downturn of the previous decade, a radically different club scene emerged. Born in Switzerland, Suzanne Barsch moved to London in 1969 and immersed herself in the city's growing club culture. When Barsch moved to New York City in 1981, she brought with her a knowledge of London's club culture, its emerging designers, and fashion trends, which afforded her high subcultural capital. Barsh opened a small boutique on Thompson Street where she featured imported clothes from emerging designers, thus serving as the de facto ambassador for, for cutting-edge British fashion. In 1987, she began hosting weekly parties at the nightclub Savage. These parties resembled fashion parades, where those seeking their fix of the underground scene could promote themselves through stylistic dress. In 1988, she began hosting a monthly party at Copacabana, where ideas in true style ruled over designer labels. Copacabana parties were in the vein of Mardi Gras, attracting a large fashion contingent that included Jean-Paul Gaultier, Donna Karen, and Calvin Klein, as well as fashion photographers such as Steven Meisel. Fashion was integral to creating the visual experience at Copacabana. One Paris-based hairstylist remarked that, quote, these parties are useful for anyone in fashion. Barsh's blend of escapist fantasy and fashion was influential to designers like Terry Mugler, whose own penchant for spectacle was evidenced in his theatrical runway presentations. In 1992, Women's Wear Daily reported, Mugler is also devoted to club hopping. Like Jean-Paul Gaultier, he draws much of his fashion inspiration from denizens of the night. With this quote in mind, I couldn't resist pairing this image from Mugler's fall 1995 collection with this club kid image taken a few years earlier. By the 1990s, the cross-pollination between nightclubs, fashion, art, and music was in full swing, and a number of style movements evolved concurrently. The reopening of clubs ushered a socio-cultural pluralism, embodied by personalities who elicited, nay craved, attention with their personal styles, popularizing the New York club scene. Betsy Johnson, Stephen Sprouse, Andre Walker, and other designers were influenced by the atmosphere pervading New York clubs and used these as spaces to promote their designs, even holding fashion shows in them. Club USA featured a VIP room designed by Mugler himself. Niche stores also arose, such as Liquid Sky, which sold ready-to-wear ensembles geared towards rave and club culture. During the 1990s, New York's drag community became an indispensable component of the city's club culture as it transitioned from an underground art form into the mainstream. In 1992, when RuPaul's song Supermodel hit it big, it attracted significant attention to the downtown drag community. The art of drag was cultivated in East Village establishments such as the Pyramid. When asked in 1987 what he found most intriguing about New York's club scene, Lee Bowery cited the pyramid's uniqueness and people like Sister Dimension and Lady Bunny. Quote, their starting point is drag, but then they take it someplace else, making it more modern and exciting. There's nothing like that in London. The pyramid cultivated the talents of RuPaul, who would become a pop culture icon. In an unprecedented development in 1994, RuPaul became the face of MAC Cosmetics' Viva Glam campaign, which helped raise millions of dollars to help combat the AIDS epidemic. Fashion and drag share an affinity for transformation, and New York's nightlife served as the ideal context for a reciprocal exchange to occur. Drag certainly employed fashion and makeup to create looks or even personalities, but fashion designers too drew from elements of drag culture, often exploring and or subverting gender boundaries. Photographer Patrick McMullen observed that nightlife pioneers such as Diane, Suzanne Barsh and Diane Brill were hugely influential to fashion designers and drag performers. RuPaul, for example, found a muse in Diane Brill. Drag, too, became an integral component of Barsh's events and even her personal style. In 1992, Mugler began employ employing drag queens and transsexuals as runway models, presenting gender itself as a drag act. He continued to experiment with gender when he recruited Zaldi Goko and Kabuki Starshine, prominent figures in New York's club scene, to model, his runway to model in his runway presentations. Ironically, by 1995, many active in New York's downtown culture bemoaned that drag now assumed such a prominent position in the mainstream. In Harlem, the phenomenon of voguing had also strengthened the relationship between fashion and club culture. 
The dress to impress aesthetic of voguing balls fostered an atmosphere where gay and, trans and transgendered African Americans and Latinos could live out their fashion fantasies, emulating the pages of Vogue in competitions. Ball participants with the most stylish walk, dance, and face were awarded trophies and, more importantly, gained bragging rights. Barsh, who had been attending Harlem Balls in the mid-80s, was among the first to bring voguing and drag ball culture into the mainstream. In 1989, she organized the Love Ball, an event bringing together fashion industry elite to raise money for the Design Industry Foundation for AIDS. Judged by fashion designers including Carolina Herrera, Donna Karen, and Terry Mugler, the event incorporated numerous elements from New York's nightlife and was lauded, quote, the biggest public display of voguing by the New York Times. The angular body movements and extreme body poses characteristic of voguing would catch the attention of Gautier and Mugler, who began featuring voguers in their runway shows. In 1990, Madonna, who attended Barsh's Love Ball, released her hit song Vogue and featured voguers Willie Ninja and Jose and Luis Extravaganza in the music video. The Club Kids were a, were a group of decadent pseudo-celebrities who shocked the public with outrageous looks and a penchant for breaking all the rules of convention. They engaged in fashion extremism and exhibitionism, creating inventive costumes for each night out. This scene began to take shape in the late 80s as a stylistic phenomenon defined by youths dressing in cutting-edge designer labels such as Steven Sprouse or Jean-Paul Gaultier. It began as a reaction to the stale scene at more conservative clubs such as Nell's. However, it quickly progressed to encompass looks combining creativity with provocation via the subversion of gender stereotypes and the creation of style mashups. An emphasis on childlike aesthetics initially permeated the club kids scene, but in dressing to outdo one another, more outre styles emerged. At times, styles bordered on the grotesque, making use of facial piercings and extreme makeup, but ultimately looks inspired by cyberpunk or S&M accessorized with a lunchbox or odd-looking backpack and platform shoes were all de rigueur. The club kids created a movement with a clearly defined aesthetic. Gender was fluid, everything was DIY, and tapping into your inner fabulosity was paramount. Particularly significant was Lee Bowery's influence on the club kids. Lee was the club kid god, extolled James St. James. He was the one who outdid everybody. With appearances on the Joan Rivers show and Geraldo, for example, the club kids created an impromptu, uh, impromptu youth movement, becoming celebrities at the national level. Youth throughout the United States who had been made to feel like misfits in their respective communities converged on New York City's club culture. Annual style summits were organized to promote the movement. These featured fashion shows, style competitions, and attracted DJs and promoters from all over. The club kids scene precipitated numerous fashion trends related to body piercing, cyberpunk, lunchboxes, and extreme platform footwear, to name a few. During a 1993 television segment on club kids, Phil Donahue remarked, many of these outrageous fashion styles do make their way to the rack at pennies. In 1994, New York Magazine's spring fashion issue addressed cyberpunk and featured models with facial piercings wearing silver metallic garments. That same year, Anna Sui, Helmut Lang, Steven Sprouse, and Julie Bett showed collections evidencing an edgy cyberpunk club kid influence. This article from the March 1994 issue of Vogue highlights the influence of cyberpunk, referencing an image of former club kid Jenny Dembrow seen on this promotional flyer for the limelight. A 1995 New York Times article observed that, quote, a commercial art form like fashion most immediately takes on those forms that have a degree of transgression or shock about them, unquote. Capitalizing on the subcultural capital of New York's club scene, Calvin Klein's CK1 campaign featured pierced, half-clothed young men and women. It invited, it invited buyers to put on the unisex scent and, as the New York Times suggested, become, quote, initiated into that exalted clan, even if your parents won't allow you a nose ring. Klein would also recruit Dembrow for his jeans advertisement. Drug use by prominent club kids and their attendant legal troubles spelled the end for the 1990s club scene. Creative talents persevered, however, as their art continued to be recognized by the fashion and music world. Kabuki Starshine, for example, who wowed clubbers with his otherworldly looks, is now a makeup artist for pop stars such as Lady Gaga and Katy Perry. Matthew Anderson and Zaldi Gogo, who began, who, who began work with Suzanne Barsh, were hired by Donna Karen. Together, 
They designed costumes for RuPaul and imagery for the makeup brand Shiseido. Saldi, who studied here at the Fashion Institute of Technology, established a career as a fashion and costume designer for top pop musicians. In 1999, former club kid Richie Rich and business partner Travis Raines founded the clothing label Heatherette. Heatherette used fun as a markable concept and hearkened to the club kid ethos by bringing, by quote, bringing out the pop star in everybody. Heatherette was discovered by, by style guru Patricia Field when Field's store manager spotted Rich wearing a custom leather top out at a club and proceeded to order 20 tops for her store. Field's downtown boutique provided a unique intersection of club culture and fashion, and she often recruited talent directly from within New York's nightlife community. Club culture also informed the work of designer Jeremy Scott, a Pratt fashion student in the 90s. Immersed in New York's club scene, he found his muse and fellow club guard Jenny Dembrow, outfitting her for her nightly debuts at clubs like Limelight. Dembro modeled in Scott's graduation show, seen here, which was inspired by the Chernobyl disaster and featured futuristic Russian peasants in plastic vinyl, platform sandals, and ski masks. Scott, who grew up admiring the designs of Jean-Paul Gaultier and the art of Andy Warhol, has produced collections that subvert the norm and parody consumer culture. Recent collections for the Italian fashion house Moschino, Moschino uh, where Scott is creative director, have referenced McDonald's and SpongeBob SquarePants. His designs for both his namesake label and Moschino embrace pop culture and regularly recall the youthful spirit of 1990s club culture that nurtured his creativity. The influence of 1980s and 90s club culture has endured. Every few seasons, runways showcase looks suggestive of club finery and the styles that were a mainstay of that period in nightclub history. Gautier's spring 2013 collection, for example, called upon the sartorial style of Boy George. That same year, Japanese Vogue drew upon the subcultural capital of voguing in its fashion editorial, How to Vogue for Vogue. Music artists such as Nicki Minaj and Lady Gaga affirm the club culture ethos of self-expression and creativity. Gaga, in particular, has been credited with creating a nouveau club kid style. Although it's important to note that some of those involved in creating her aesthetic were themselves born of club culture. Today, nightlife empresarios such as Suzanne Barsh continue to create spaces for creativity to flourish, thus paving the way for a new era of ingenuity. As fashion designer and nightlife personality, Dominique Echiavera remarked, quote, I look at nightlife as an opportunity to showcase my work. The club is a runway for the strange and the extraordinary. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for questions, if there are any. Do you think today New York and London are still subcultural capitals? And are there any others? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think they're still considered subcultural capitals. Um, but I also think, you know, cities like Berlin are considered subcultural capitals today. Um, you know, things are changing. There's new, um, there's new fashion cities emerging all the time. And with that, you have the reaction of that. So new subcultures emerging. Um, so I think, yes, there's, there's new ones emerging all the time. Thank you. OK, thank you again.